When you think of FNAF animatronics with lore significance, you likely think of things like Golden Freddy and Springtrap. But there's one character who's been very synonymous with FNAF lore and has been very prominent since the second game. Basically introduced right alongside William Afton himself, and acting as a centerpiece for all of his victims. And that character is the puppet, or the marionette, whatever you prefer. And for this video, I want to go over the entire history and story of this character and figure out how they impact the overall franchise and if they've been a good or bad influence on it overall. Because there is consistently a lot of tension surrounding this character in the lore. So without further ado, let's look at FNAF 2. See what I did there? That was like a rhyme. That was like a rhyme I did there. The first sort of reference to the puppet that you can find in the FNAF series actually comes from FNAF 1 with these posters that on rare occasion can show up on the wall in the hallway. Now these are more accurately the precursor to the crying children sprites in the minigames in FNAF 2, but it's also pretty clear that those tear stripes in the crying children is what the tear stripes on the puppet are supposed to look like. So you can basically count this as sort of the origin of the character or in kind of their first appearance, but not really. Now, like everybody on the planet knows, the puppet's actual first appearance was in FNAF 2, and it was a pretty major mechanic of the game. And let's just listen to how Phone Guide describes it. So our temporary solution is this. There's a music box over by the prize counter, and it's rigged to be wound up remotely. So just every once in a while, switch over to the prize counter video feed and wind it up for a few seconds. It doesn't seem to affect all of the animatronics, but it does affect Yeah, 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 it's very cool, Mr. Cawthon, but I want to take a quick moment to say that I've decided this video is a Christmas special. Why? Because the puppet is in a gift box, and the Hex plushie comes with a present that looks like a Christmas present. So, in conclusion, Merry Christmas. Anyway, back on in the video. I don't know why I added this in. But anyway, back onto the topic I was actually supposed to be talking about. These phone calls pretty clearly paint the picture that the puppet is pretty widely known among the Fazbear employees to be kind of haunted, and that the mechanisms that it works behind are kind of scary. To the point where the phone guy pretty clearly talks about it with fear in his voice, which is something he doesn't do with any other character. And I think this was a really great way to introduce the player to the idea of this puppet without directly showing it. Because obviously, the goal of the game is not seeing it. You want to keep that thing in its box because you are pretty clearly told that this thing getting out is instant death. And that's another thing about the character. The means of keeping it away is very peculiar. You play music for it like it's a baby or something. It's weird, and it definitely sells the idea that this thing is a lot different from the other animatronics. Not even really being treated like an animatronic. And why this is, is further explained through the death minigames. One of the many death minigames in FNAF 2 is a minigame called Save Him. Now, note that it says Save Him. This marks one of the first retcons in the series. The puppet's spirit was originally going to be a boy, and, and then it was changed to a girl. This doesn't really matter that much, but it is noteworthy. And you guys know the iconic scene that follows. William Afton pulls up in his goofy purple car, kills the kid in a undescript, mysterious way, and then proceeds to drive off and not elaborate. Like, I, can someone explain what's happening here? He drives by, he gets out of his car, and then the kid just dies and then he leaves. Did he did was it was he did he look so scary that they fainted? Did he just like touch them and use his evil powers to kill them? I get it's just a simplified minigame, but I really like to imagine this is one to one with how the events played out and this is just what happened. William Afton having evil ability to touch people and they magically turn to a ghost and die is really funny. But anyway, this scene plays out um, supposedly William Afton's first murder, however Chica says otherwise, and we get a jump scare from the puppet. 
Another iconic death minigame from FNAF 2 is the Give Gifts, Give Life minigame. Which shows that the puppet basically gave the kids the ability to control the animatronics that they were stuffed into, giving them a second shot at life after being killed early, and an opportunity to get revenge on their killer. And I'm all completely aware that this is extremely basic knowledge nowadays, but back then, this was pretty huge, because in FNAF 1, <laughs> what will we have for the lore? Foxy is a good guy because he doesn't jump up at your face when he kills you? A mistake that Scott clearly corrected in the second game by giving Foxy the absolute most aggressive jump scare in the series. But there's not really a whole lot to say about the puppet in FNAF 2 outside of what I've already covered, because... Besides that, the puppet is in the music box the whole game. When the puppet isn't in the music box, it's... So, not really too much else to say about this character, but it's an extremely cool addition to the series, and I couldn't imagine the series without this character. Like, think about it. If this character didn't exist, FNAF 2's gameplay might have been good. Okay, but on a serious note, the puppet did add a lot to the story of the classic FNAF games. And, as I said earlier, acting as a centerpiece to all of the ghost kids. This force that's kind of holding them all together. And it's even real in FNAF 2 that the puppet was in the FNAF 1 location, which is cool. Where was the puppet in the FNAF 1 location? Uh, I don't know, just pick a spot on this map that isn't visible on the cameras, there's a couple. Something that is definitely not true, but is very cool to think about, is that the puppet could have been behind us in FNAF 1, and I really like that idea. And now let's move on to the puppet's character design, cause this is a really good design. Just like all around, this hits all the right notes. First of all, for being a character with a static mask, the way that Scott worked expressions in this character is actually kind of genius. Like, it's indefinitely crying and has a big smile on its face, so you can't really decipher much from that. But, I love the way that when the head turns downward, you can see it, the eyebrows kind of get angry by the angle that the mask is at. That is just, like, extremely smart design, and I really, really appreciate it. Gives a lot of personality to a character that would have otherwise been pretty stiff and emotionless. The mask kind of representing anger and tears works very well for the context of the character. The striped limbs and the long fingers are really, really cool. The buttons on the torso tie everything together very nicely. I like the long limbs and neck. I really like freakishly tall character designs because they look like hell to work with, but the people who made them just did it anyway, and I love that. I especially like it when the animation takes advantage of that, but since the original FNAF games didn't have much animation, it took us until Help Wanted to see the puppet in motion, but oh my gosh, this walk cycle is so cool. Like, it took forever to see, but this one animation made it worth it, because I don't even know, I don't even fathom how people animate like this, this is so cool. <laughs> But, I think that concludes most of my thoughts on Five Nights at Freddy's 2, so I think it's about time we move on to Five Nights at Freddy's 3. That's the third game. What? 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 What's up? But, help! I think this one render is the most interesting thing to say about the Phantom Puppet. There's not even really much to say, it's just a neat render. Because seriously, what is going on here? How is the puppet physically showing up here? I mean, I guess it's possible. The puppet, we know the puppet still existed at this point in the timeline. But like, while the mask is also on the wall? Are, are there just multiple? If the puppet is physically in the building, then what's the point of having a Phantom Puppet in the first place? That's kind of all, I have nothing else to say here, moving on. Now, upon the release of Five Nights at Freddy's 4, the puppet is not in the game, not even mentioned. But, it should also be mentioned that FNAF 4 was meant to release in October of 2015, but ended up releasing early in July of 2015. And, it is a very rare occurrence for games to release early, but it's also kind of a rare case to have anybody like Scott Cawthon. So the game released in July, people liked it, kind of. And Scott had promised DLC for the game, coming in Halloween when the game was originally intended to release. And this DLC came in the form of a Halloween mode, which basically just kind of swapped out a few characters for other things. 
which isn't the most intuitive thing in the world, but it is pretty neat. And we got quite a few awesome designs from this DLC, like Jacko Chica, Jacko Bonnie, Nightmare Mangle, even if I find Nightmare Mangle rather forgettable. And Nightmare Mangle does seem a bit random for the Halloween theming, but this DLC was originally going to have a much heavier emphasis on FNAF 2, with a Nightmare Toy Freddy initially being planned for it, but then he was cut because apparently Toy Freddy retired. I think Scott just didn't want to make the model. But we also got a character from this DLC who has become one of my favorite characters in the whole series, and that is Nightmareon. I want to apologize in advance for the audio in the next part being kind of low quality. Now, not only is this design extremely creepy, with how it mixes the puppet with the Grim Reaper, which is just a really cool idea. The very skeletal body with the tangled limbs works extremely well. I love this mask so much. I genuinely do find this to be a superior design to the original puppet, and I do like how it was so cool that it ended up becoming canon later on, but we'll get into that later. Oh yeah, that's probably important to mention. Nightmare Yon is not canon in FNAF 4, but specifically FNAF 4. Other appearances, like Seltimate Custom Knight and Help Wanted, are canon. Which is something I think is really interesting about this character, how it was originally a non-canon Halloween character that eventually did become canon and even got lore implications. You wanna see something cool? Here's a picture of Nightmareon's jump scare. Now here's it brightened up. Here, and then it's th same goes for him in the hallways too. I don't know why Scott decided to do this because it's freaking terrifying, but I love it. It's so cool. But sadly, I'm not allowed to talk about the lore implications of Nightmareon in FNAF 4 because, um... Nightmareon isn't canon in this game. But I can say it's interesting that they take the place of Nightmare specifically. Because Nightmare is implied to be death, basically. And Nightmareon, as I said before, is a mixture of the puppet and death. Isn't that neat? Alright, now let's move on to Sister Location, because that game... has no puppet, never mind. I guess the mini arenas kind of look like the puppet. I very vividly remember when uh, when Sister Location came out, I was watching Markiplier play through the game because I couldn't get past Night 2. And I saw this jump scare in his video and my mind was blown because I thought it was like an early version of the puppet, like before they were painted. And I thought this was like some huge lore. And then turn out to be the mini arena. So now we move on to Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator, the one game in the FNAF series with that one cutscene everybody talks about, then absolutely nothing else that people talk about. Unless they want to gaslight themselves into thinking Scrap Trap looks good again. But uh, yeah, uh, Happy Frog is in this game. I think this character design is really bad. Oh, we were talking about the puppet. FNAF 6 arguably gives the most lore for the puppet out of any FNAF game. Well, besides FNAF 2, but that's besides the point. This game tells us a lot and even gives us a different perspective of an event we saw in FNAF 2. And it's shown here that a bunch of bullies had locked Charlie out of the pizzeria. The puppet spirit's name is Charlie. And then she mysteriously gets dragged away, which we see in the other minigame was by William Afton. And then it activates the security puppet to go out and try to rescue her, but she's already dead in the alleyway outside the pizzeria, so then the puppet just kinda clings to her, and that leads to her possessing the puppet. So basically just like a little origin story for this character, which is pretty cool. The alleyway of Fredbear's in this minigame also looks eerily similar to the alleyway of the FNAF 6 location, which could, you know, maybe mean that the FNAF 6 location is Fredbear's. I brought this up before, but every time I get a chance to bring this up, this theory, I want to bring it up because it's a really cool idea. Oh yeah, it's also revealed in this game that Charlie is the daughter of Henry, who is William Afton's old big business partner, who was only ever mentioned in the books, it was only brought into the games for FNAF 6, where he did a big speech at the end, and that's the only thing he's ever done, it's the only reason anybody ever talked- Okay, well I'm being a bit exaggerating. I think Henry is a pretty important character, I just think it's kind of crazy how he ne was never mentioned in the game universe outside of like an one offhand line in FNAF 2, until the literal finale of the original games. But this wasn't technically our introduction to Henry. Our introduction to Henry was in the novels, which I will talk about next, but let's finish talking about FNAF 6. The puppet is brought into FNAF 6 through an animatronic that Henry built called Lefty. 
Lefty is one of my favorite animatronics in the whole series. I love this goofball. Such a funny little character. I love this guy. The color palette works extremely nicely. I'm surprised they hadn't done a bear using black and red before this because it looks really cool. But yeah, Lefty captures the puppet inside of it. You can see this in the alleyway. And Lefty basically just contains the puppet throughout the game and is a way to keep the puppet in the pizzeria without you knowing. And I think the idea of this weird, kind of off-putting entertainment animatronic secretly being a device to capture a haunted object is really cool. But because it's not immediately apparent to the player that Lefty contains the puppet or what is up with him, the puppet herself doesn't really get much focus at all outside of the minigames and obviously the ending. While every other animatronic gets voice lines and added character depth, I guess. I mean, Scrap Baby, you can kind of see her descending into the path that her father took. You get some interesting insight from William as well, but Funtime Freddy is just being Funtime Freddy. But at the ending of this game, we get to hear Henry, the father of this character, directly address her. My daughter, if you can hear me, I knew you would return as well. It's in your nature to protect the innocent. I'm sorry that on that day, the day you were shut out and left to die, no one was there to lift you up into their arms the way you lifted others into yours. And then what became of you? I should have known you wouldn't be content to disappear. Not my daughter. I couldn't save you then. So let me save you now. It's time to rest for you and for those you have carried in your arms. This ends for all of us in communication. Number 9, Rick Sanchez. My favorite anime character, Rick Sanchez. Toxic Rick is undefeated. Now, I think it's cool how this really elaborates on how, like, the puppet did carry all the other spirits and was the thing that led to them using their spirits to possess the animatronics. And even if you didn't know who Henry is, this one factor would be probably enough of a motivation for you to know why he wants to do this. And the fact that he was an old friend of William's too. And I really appreciate how this is one of the only parts in the FNAF series where they actually just give answers. Like, not not implied or not, just, just answers here. And I appreciate that. I wish they did that more. But yeah, now I think it's an important time to move on to a, a very important part of this character which is the novel series. <laughs> now sit back and relax as I'm going to explain a summary of the novel trilogy and what Charlie's deal is in it and Henry's deal is, um, and I'm gonna explain it over Fortnite, Fortnite. gameplay. So basically, this novel, tr this novel trilogy takes place in an alternate universe to the main FNAF timeline that is in the games. And in this universe, Charlie um, was supposedly never killed, and instead her twin brother Sammy was killed instead. Um, and we go through the journey of Charlie as an adult coping with the uh, murders of her friends when she was So little. then her and a bunch of her friends go to um, explore the old Freddy Fazbear's Pizza and yada yada yada. Meet with William Afton, uh, he gets spring along, and then um, next book. In the next book, uh, there's the twisted animatronics and stuff, but this isn't really relevant. Uh, she learns more about, like, her dad and Henry and what William worked on with Henry and stuff. And then, um, oh yeah, um, Henry had a, a little robot, um, that had a big knife. And the robot with the big knife kills him. He built the robot to kill himself. Oh, and then also, Charlie is not actually Charlie in this universe, because she did get murdered by William. But she's actually a robot recreation of Charlie. It looks exactly the same, and Henry built multiple of them for each like stage of growth in her life. And this is like a robot Charlie, I guess. And the robot Charlie is like re replaced the, the the original Charlie. And Henry went insane building robots to convince himself that his daughter wasn't dead. And the robot recreation Charlie had to be told that she was a robot because she literally did not know. So now this realistic human Charlie was actually the basis for um, what William Afton you would turn slow. into Circus Baby in this universe. And Circus Baby disguises herself as Charlie 
in the book after Fourth Closet after Charlie dies at the end of Twisted Ones. Um, and then this happens. And you know, it gets even crazier because this also happens. Also, meanwhile, the evil version of Charlie, who is also Circus Baby, is also possessed by Elizabeth Afton because her backstory is exactly the same in this universe, just with the added factor that Baby is a robot copy of Charlie. In the game universe, she is not. Do you see how insane this is? And despite this being the one side of the lore that Scott has explicitly stated is not canon to the games, the idea of a Charlie bot showing up in the video games has been haunting the FNAF theory scene for years. And these pins on Circus Baby are not helping. And the entirety of that has absolutely nothing to do with the character she possesses in the games. Because in the novel universe, the security puppet at Fredbear's literally just did not exist. I don't even think the story of the novels is inherently awful. Like, I enjoyed reading them. I like the books. I think they have a neat storyline going on. I like it separate from the games. But their impact on the game's lore has left this ripple effect that has made everything so convoluted. And while the convoluted FNAF lore we have right now is quite fun to look into, it's also pretty apparent that the impact of this storyline was not for the better. Or maybe it was, I don't know, I don't know what the FNAF story would look like if we didn't have the novel trilogy. Or maybe I do, maybe Scholastic would be bankrupt. But I would not want to live in a world where we don't have the Mimic. What was he talking about again? I can't think. Turn off the damn Spongebob music. Now something interesting about Ultimate Custom Night is that Nightmare Yon is on the cover of the game. That's it. Okay, Nightmare Yon goes over a character who is supposed to represent death. Nightmare Yon is the puppet. This is William Afton's Purgatory on the cover of the game. Nightmare Yon is the personal manifestation of death for William. This is not a headcanon, this is fact, and if you want to argue otherwise, go away. But yeah, serious talk, I think Nightmare Yon being the personal manifestation of death for William is pretty perfect, and the fact that it's the cover of this game kind of supports that theory a lot. Nightmare Yon even gets a voice in this game, who, and it's one of the, my favorite voices in the series. I desperately want this character to make a proper return, just so we can hear this voice again, because it is so cool. This time, death cannot save you. The nightmare is just beginning. Let's taste death again and again and again. The way how most of their voice lines are centered around death and the fact that they say, I am the fearful reflection of what you have created, I feel like my theory holds up pretty well. And yeah, this is just a really, really cool character, and I think it's just the perfect character to be the face of this game. And this confirms that Nightmare Yon is canon, indeed canon, not canon in FNAF 4, but is canon in Ultimate Custom Night. Make sure to- that is a important detail. Sadly, I do not have nearly as many nice things to say about the puppet's voice in this game. I don't hate you, but you need to stay out of my way. I recognize you, but I'm not afraid of you. Not anymore. Man, what the hell? Is this seriously the voice that they're gonna associate with the thing that is always thinking and it can go anywhere? Like, I feel like giving this character a voice, regardless of what the voice is, just kind of ruins a lot of the reason why it's creepy in the first place. Especially when said voice is just... is just a little girl. You're late to class. I'll let it slide this time since it's your first day, but be late I again. I don't hate and you, repeat but you need to stay out of my- A very sassy one at that. Like, I do not think that this voice fits for Charlie. But it does not fit for the puppet. I would have honestly preferred the puppet just not have anything in this game, voice line wise. I, I feel like that's just like, I don't know. 
every time I see this character, I think every time I think about this voice line, just any like creep factor just like completely goes away. And that is a damn shame. But anyway, I guess that's all I really have to say about Ultimate Custom Night. I mean, all there really is to say about Ultimate Custom Night is voice line, because the rest of it is just kind of like really one note game mechanics, because there's 50 animatronics. So I guess we should move on to Five Nights at Freddy's Help One. Oh, wait, I talked about that earlier. I guess we should move on to Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach. Charlie Bots ruined this child. I think it's pretty clear at this point that they're trying to convey to us that Gregory is a real human boy. They have actively avoided any of the robot parallels that people have been seeing that don't exist. I think it is quite obvious that at this point, Gregory is just supposed to be a human boy. That this is a human child who has like a virus in his head. This is not a literal robot. His eyes distort when he sees Vanny, though. That's because the same thing happens to Moon. It's a game mechanic. I am sorry, but the Mimic is not a Circus Baby Charlie bot. It is the Mimic. They wrote a whole backstory on the thing. It's still crazy to me how off the rails FNAF theories got when Security Breach came out. But honestly, understandably, in terms of the puppet in this game, there's like two plushies around the pizzeria. It's nothing really too major. Nightmarion, on the other hand... For some unknown reason, has an extreme pr implied presence in the Pizzaplex, and nobody has really come up with a definitive answer as to why this is. Some people can try to link it back to Charlie. I guess that's understandable. But then you remember that one of the spirits whose eyes on the blob are deliberately not lit up is the puppet's eyes, so, um... It also deliberately has the tear tracks removed. Um, which is what, in, which is what indicates that the puppet is possessed. If you're subscribed to the theory that Glitch Trap is William Afton, then you could see this as death making its presence known that William Afton's time is almost up. That's a cool idea. I like that idea. Someone should make a video on- oh wait. All of the staff bots that are evil in the game have f Nightmare on faces painted on them and their chest says, In Your Dreams. What does this mean? We still don't know. They appeared again in Help Wanted 2. We still don't know what they mean. It's just so baffling to me. There's also these hidden Nightmare on plushies everywhere in the Pizzaplex, and nobody knows what these mean either. They're in Help Wanted 2 as well. I think Steel Wool just does it because they think it's funny at this point. Because it doesn't- we don't seem to be getting any closer to getting an answer to these things, but they still appear in the same ways they have in Security Breach. We just- have even less context because Help Wanted 2's story is like non-existent. What the heck is happening in this game? I hope this mystery gets solved because I really want to see Nightmare on again. Like stop teasing me like this, okay? Get Alex Lee back and get some more voice lines and let me hear this awesome character. And now with the sort of negative reputation that Charlie and the puppet have gained from newer FNAF theories... I'm quite hopeful that the FNAF movie sequel can do a good job at kind of course correcting all of this. Because I genuinely do think this is a really cool and good character. It's just that... <laughs> uh, so, uh, I guess that's, I guess about, that's it. about it. I hope you guys enjoyed. I've really wanted to talk about this character for quite a long time, but I just, like, haven't had the right, um, like, motivation. But... I feel like seeing the FNAF movie and seeing the little tease for the sequel with the music at the end, it got me thinking a lot about the puppet, and I finally wanted to make this little analysis video to go over the whole history of this character and see what the hell happened. <laughs> Everything was kinda downhill for Charlie after FNAF 6, but I do believe that things will begin looking up again with the release of the second FNAF movie, and maybe with the new games, if they bring her back and it works well. I'd rather than just not bring her back, but you know. So yeah, I didn't really know how to end this video properly, so uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. It's been a while since I've had a pretty long video. Um, some of my plushies are still in stock. Like a very, very limited quantity of them. I think like six are left, so uh, if you want one, link in the pinned comment. Okay, goodbye. <laughs>